Hello, everybody, and welcome to Anatomy of a Video with uh, Richard Dietz and Aaron Weiss. Uh, we're going to be getting going here. Going to make a quick announcement that we are recording the webinar. Um, and so if you don't want to be on the recording, then don't type anything into the chat or ask any questions. And you can stay completely hidden from, from view and nobody will know. Uh, we will be making a download of the uh, video recording as well as the slide deck available um, later on today or to, by tomorrow morning for sure on both of our blogs. So you'll be able to get those as well. Um, so hopefully you're here turning in, tuning into Anatomy of a Video um, with Aaron and Richard. If not, then you might as well just stay anyways and enjoy the, uh, the video. So just to make sure everything's working properly, um, if you can hear me well and you can see the PowerPoint presentation there on the screen, if you can just type really quickly into the chat box there, yes, or let's go, or type something in there just so I can make sure that people are actually alive and uh, you know, breathing and, and paying attention there. That would be fabulous. And you should be able to see a chat box in your little uh, GoToWebinar window um, over on the right-hand side of your screen. There's a little orange arrow that you can use to expand that window if you need to. Okay. Uh, we'll go ahead and get going here. Um, I will get the presentation into full presentation view here so we can see that. Okay, we'll do quick introductions here. Um, I'll, I'll let Aaron go ahead and go first. Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Aaron Weiss. I am the owner and operator of One Story Productions, and um, we can tell you, I'll tell you a little bit, of, a bit about, more about our company a little later. Hi, I'm Richard Dietz from uh, Nonprofit R&D, and uh, I'm basically a, a consulting firm here uh, working with nonprofits on technology issues, and uh, we do a little bit of everything um, from online video to SEO to email marketing, website development, all of that, and uh, we got a lot of material to go over today, so we'll just kind of jump into it, and we will have time at the end for questions and answers. Um, the first thing I want to do is give you a link to a video that we're going to be watching later in the presentation. Um, and that is going to um, be over on YouTube. There is a link right here. There is also, uh, if you can't find it there, you can also search for Right at Home uh, Galveston, and the video is right on their home page. But um, I put this in the chat box. Um, I can actually go ahead and put it in there again just to make sure everybody has it. Um, and if you go to that video right now, go to that link um, and start playing the video um, and then pause it once it starts playing, then we'll let that download as we talk about a couple other things. Um, and we'll, uh, then we'll come back to that and it should be fully downloaded and we'll be able to uh, play that. We're going to give you about four minutes to watch that right before we go into breaking down that video uh, kind of step by step. Um, so just want to get you going on that right now. And while you're doing that, we're going to continue on with the presentation. So the agenda, what are we going to talk about today? Um, we are going to talk about, actually, um, Aaron, can you talk about the agenda real quick? Um, I think there might be something going on in the chat box. I was going to go jump over and look at that really quick. So if you can just talk through um, what we're going to talk about here, that'd be great. Sure thing. We're going to start with why online video, why people, why you should be interested and, and want to start using online video. Um, then we're going to go into a little bit of how to get started and initial steps and, and uh, kind of strategy and planning. And, and initial uh, ways to edit and you know, resources to, uh, to be able to get started with that strategy and planning before you actually get into the meat of it. Um, then we're going to kind of go into the anatomy of the video and, and break down uh, a video that we've created um, for, for a, a local company and um, kind of talk about step-by-step -step the sections and elements that, that kind of go into to that video. And then afterwards we're going to give you guys some tools and resources and and how to get started and um, put and implement everything, and then we'll give you guys a chance to ask some questions and, and give you guys an, an opportunity to uh, be able to get started. Okay, looks like Aaron, we're having a problem with the chat box. Um, I got a couple. I just got a uh, email and stuff from folks that said they cannot see the chat box. Um, it's coming up on my other computer that I'm testing with here, but if other people can't see it, I just enabled a new box called Questions. Um, you might be able to see if that shows up where you can type in. Okay, and it looks like some people are saying the questions are now showing up or the chat box is now showing up. I had to raise, oh, David said I had to raise and lower my hand to get the chat box to show up. 
So if folks want to try that, please try that. Um, nice. If you look at your name in the list on the control panel, there's a little hand with an arrow on it. Go ahead and raise your hand and lower your hand, and apparently the chat box will start showing up then. I apologize for that technical di difficulty there. Um, so hopefully Aaron, a, just go ahead. Go ahead. I, I just uh, included that YouTube link again. I don't know if it had it from before, but if you guys would click on that YouTube link and um, start the download of, of that video so when we get to that section, it will be able to play uh, fully in full. Okay, and I also just put the URL into the question box. So hopefully, um, even if you can't uh, see the chat box, you can see the question box, and hopefully you can get the URL there. Um, if not, don't, don't worry about it. I think you'll still get a lot from the webinar, um, you know, even if you don't watch the video. Um, the other option is, like I said, just go to Google and type in uh, R-A-H Galveston, and you should come up with the Right at Home Galveston homepage. And they do have the video right on their homepage, so you'll be able to watch that there. And we'll, we'll go over that again once we get to that part of the, uh, of the video. So sorry about that and for the confusion on the, uh, the technical difficulty there. Um, OK, so the next slide here um, is probably going to date me a little bit. But when I was uh, a kid, my favorite show uh, in the whole world was Different Strokes with uh, Gary Coleman. And his tagline during that was the, what you talking about, Willis? And so this is kind of a slide I always put up because it's a pet peeve of mine of technology folks that once they get up and start speaking to an audience, they start using all these big words and, and acronyms and all this techno jargon. And no one in the audience has any idea what they're talking about. And they're afraid to uh, you know, raise their hand and ask a question. So Aaron and I try really hard to uh, not use any jargon or acronyms without defining them. But if we ever do, just uh, raise your hand or type it in the question box or the chat box um, and pretty much call us on it. And we'll go back and explain what that is. So uh, that is that. Next slide. Always look for what's working. So uh, this is something that's really important to me is that I don't just look at other nonprofits, and a I think Aaron does the same thing. Uh, we don't just look at nonprofits for what's working or what's not working. We look everywhere. We do look at other nonprofits, but we look a lot at the business world. Um, and the reason we look at the business world is because they have billions and trillions of dollars to spend on research and evaluation and all of these things that, that, that they could look into and they come up with some great results on social psychology and, and uh, you know consumer behavior and all of that and a lot of that is really applicable to the nonprofit world so we take kind of what we see in the business world apply it to how nonprofits can 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 use that um, I also use a lot from the internet marketing realm um, and that's everything from the get rich quick schemes to you know Amazon and just selling things on, on eBay and the reason I look at internet marketing folks is because they do a really good job at testing they test everything they test subject lines they test headlines they test price points um, and then they talk about this testing um, in their internet marketing forums and so I glean a lot of uh, information from there um, and the third place I get a lot of my ideas from is infomercials if you've ever heard of the sham Wow uh, it's an amazing product that they sell on TV at late night and it's a it's a little squeegee cloth and one of these cloths can soak up an entire gallon of milk um, and I'm an infomercial junkie mm -hmm. I will sit there and watch them pretty much all night long I don't ever buy anything but I learn a lot from them um, and, and they're really good. Again, they do a lot of research and a lot of study into how people behave. Um, and, and they build campaigns that get people excited. They use a lot of visuals. They use, you know, it's all infomercials. It's on video. Um, and they use a lot of testimonials. They use a lot of personal connection. And a lot of stuff we're going to be talking about today, um, infomercials are really good at doing and making you want to buy that product. Um, and so Aaron and I grab a lot of lessons um, from, from there as well. So why online video? Um, we won't spend too much time on this, but we're definitely going to go a little bit about um, why you should be doing online video. And one of the main reasons we're doing this is we did have a couple of folks when they registered, they, they typed into the why are you not using video? A couple of folks said, I'm not sure if, it, if we should, I'm not sure if it's very effective, or I'm not sure if you know, it, it, it's the right thing to do. So we just wanted to cover that um, a, a little bit before we move on. Um, the first thing to say is it's more affordable and easier than ever. I mean, now all you need is a flip cam and a YouTube account and you can pretty much have video on your website uh, within minutes. Um, it's so easy to do. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about the tools on how you can do that in a, in, 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 in a moment. Um, it is super effective. So Aaron and I have both had clients um, that have had really good results um, from, from, from video. Um, but those are smaller kind of anecdotal um, evidence. So looking at 
ways to show that it's effective. Um, the Wharton School of Business did an amazing study where they showed that uh, having video integrated into their marketing increased their effectiveness by 600%. Uh, so again, that is a business example, but I think directly ap uh, applicable, and we're going to show you kind of some of the reasons why. Uh, another great reason that you should be doing online video is it's a fabulous way to tell your story. Um, and what that means is, is it's a way to get people to listen to you. It's a way to get people to learn more about your organization and really hear about what your mission is, what makes your organization tick, why it's special. Um, and video can tell that story way better than, than print ever ever could. And I think the example video we're going to show today is, is going to show you just just that. Uh, it's also a great way to create a personal connection. Um, and what we mean by this is that people love personal stories, individual stories. Um, they want to hear about Mary and Joe and how they're affected by your organization and, 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 and how they've been helped. Um, and it's been proven that emotion gets people to take action. Um, there is, uh, we're going to talk a little, in a little bit about one of my favorite authors, Dan Aureli, um, who's a social economist, and he does a lot of studies on social behavior and how that affects uh, economic decisions. And uh, he talks a lot about when people make a decision to purchase or to donate, they'll make that decision based on emotion first, and then they'll justify it after the fact. And so how this plays out is, you know, the new iPad 2 comes out, and, and you're like, oh, my gosh, I've got to have that iPad 2. It's so cool. And you go out and you buy it. And then you spend the next five days convincing yourself why it was a good purchase because it's, it's faster, it's going to make my life easier, I'm going to be able to check email wherever I'm at. And you come up with those rational reasons, but it's really the emotion that got you to, to make that purchase. And online donations and, and fundraising um, can key on those exact same triggers. Um, so we're going to talk about how to use that emotion and, and uh, really get people to you know, whip out their wallet and give you their money. So here is, uh, I, I mentioned Dan Aureli on the previous slide. There's a URL to his website down there. Like I said, he's a social, uh, social economist, I guess is what you would call him. But he does a lot of studies um, into, into human behavior and, and especially on economic decisions. And uh, uh, one of the things that he talked about in a presentation that I saw him do was the mismatch between how much money was raised for an issue and the number of people affected by that issue. And so if you look at this little graph over here, it's really interesting to see that AIDS and malaria are two of the absolute biggest problems uh, in the world, and they're raising the least amount of money um, if you're looking at funding uh, in the millions. And then you look at what's raising the most money, it was Hurricane Katrina and at this time 9-11. Uh, um, and there's, you know, there's a tons of reasons of why that may happen, but a couple that we wanted to point out was, one, um, think about the stories you have around these issues. If you think about malaria, you know, do you have a story in your head? Do you have a visual image in your head of, of, of what the problem is? I mean, you can maybe think that there's people and they need mosquito nets and there's maybe some, some children and they're getting bit. But then if you think about Katrina and 9-11, think about the individual stories and the images that are in your head. I mean, if, when I think 9-11, I immediately see the Twin Towers, and I see a plane hitting them, and I see smoke coming out, and I see people on the rooftop, and it's just very powerful images. Online video can help make that uh, connection much stronger. And then the individual stories with Katrina, it was interviews of people that were devastated by it and people that were stuck in the Superdome, and it was those individual stories that made it real and really gets that emotional connection and, and gets people to, to, to want to donate. So basically what we want to say here is individual stories are always more effective than talking about things in, in, in aggregate. And Aaron's going to talk a little bit about that when he breaks down the, uh, the video that we're going to talk about. Um, and obviously video can, can do this a lot easier, like I talked about, those, those powerful um, images. Next, we, uh, we have YouTube and, um, and how it relates to your online video. I mean, YouTube is the number two search engine next to Google, and um, Google owns YouTube, so now they're kind of an unstoppable force. Um, there are about three billion page view views per day, and uh, every minute there's about 48 hours of video uploaded. And uh, to kind of give you an idea, the uh, number one watched YouTube video of all time is a, a Justin Bieber music video that has uh, over 500 million views. And to give that some kind of reference, um, there was about 111 viewers of the Super Bowl. And so more than four times the viewers watching Justin Bieber uh, videos. And that could be just the... Uh, 
young teenage girls clicking play over and over again. But either way, there's a there's an audience out there for you to take advantage of. Um, there's 2.9 billion hours of, of YouTube in a month. That's over 325,000 years of continuous video, and um, 490 million unique users uh, worldwide. And uh, people containing links uh, in their tweets. There's there's 400 tweets per minute with YouTube links, and 179 million watched online video in, in 2010. So it's, it's uh, definitely an outlet for, for you if you're able to take advantage of it for, for your organization or for your specific individual videos as well. Excellent. And, and it's definitely one of those things that's growing more and more every day. Um, you know, it's a, you know, YouTube is doubling and tripling all of these numbers um, every, every couple months now. It's, it's just going up astronomically. So you really want to get out in front of that tidal wave. You don't want to be the organization that doesn't have videos. You want to be the, the one that has videos out there for uh, people to, uh, to uh, view and, 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 and do all that. So. Okay, so getting started with online video. So we're going to go over some basics of, uh, you know, how you can get started with online video before we get down into the video breakdown. Depending on, you know, what you're trying to accomplish and, and who you're trying to reach, um, there are longer, more uh, complex videos that, that can work for, for your cause. But you know, I had a film teacher in, the, in college, my, my favorite professor, who used to say this every time. We, he would be critiquing our films and giving us a really honest critique. It's just he kept saying, "Keep it simple, stupid." And uh, powerful videos these days are very are are very often under two minutes long, and especially with attention span these days, and and links on the side of the videos and other opportunities to get distracted, uh, keeping these these simple and short. Uh, keep it keep your viewers uh, engaged and give them more of a, a likelihood to to send it on to other people. Who, who will watch your video and be engaged as well. Um, try, to, try to focus on one main topic or one main character or a person or a lesson or a testimonial. It's easier to get, a, uh, to get excited and again pass it on um, to people, pass it on to people if it's more focused on, a, on one idea or subject or, or, or issue. Yeah, and and in uh, many cases, you know, if you wanted to do get more content in there, sometimes it might be a better idea to break it up into smaller videos. So you almost make like a video series about a certain topic. So if it's a, uh, you know, we want to follow the story of Mary, um, break it up into two or three minute videos talking about Mary over the course of a couple months. Um, and one that's going to be it's going to be a really cool story to kind of see how it progresses over time. But it also gives people a reason to come back to your site um, or, or or come back to your YouTube channel and 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 watch the next video. Video, um, in the uh, series, so that's it's another way to keep them a little shorter and uh, br and and break them up. Uh, the next section is online on um, online video basics. Is basically uh, you don't want to just jump into online video before you have some real basic fundamentals set up first. So the first thing you always want to ask is what are you hoping to accomplish with online video? Um, you got to be thinking about what it is you want to accomplish and how you're going to go about that. There's going to be some questions that we're, Aaron's going to be talking about in the strategy and planning section we're going into next. But you want to start everything with that question. What are you hoping to accomplish? Is it to get more traffic to your website? Is it to increase funding? Is it to get people to know more about your organization? Um, know what that is as you create the video um, so you know who the audience is, who you're targeting, how long it should be, um, all of that stuff. Um, this is one of my really, really big pet peeves is you need sound fundamentals first. And I think this goes for online video and it also goes for social media. And that is you need to have a clean, functional website, a website that makes sense, that is easy to navigate, that people can find, can, can, can get around in. Um, you need to have a way to capture email addresses. Um, you know, social media is the big thing right now. It's all the rage, but email is still the most effective fundraising mechanism for most organizations, uh, at, at, at least online. Um, so you want to be capturing that email address. Once you capture the email address, you're able to follow up with them on a regular basis, let them learn more um, about your organization. Um, there is a, uh, a saying in the business community that it takes um, up to seven touches before somebody is willing to buy your product. 
Um, now, you know, this isn't a pack of gum. If it's a, a larger type product, it takes up to seven touches. And touches can be phone calls, emails, advertisements, whatever it is. Uh, I think the same thing is true with nonprofit organizations. Um, you know, if someone's not going to come to your website, and the very first time they ever get there, they're going to pull out their wallet and uh, donate. They're going to want to learn a bit, little bit more about you. So if you don't capture the email address, you're just hoping that they'll come back and, uh, and, and learn more about your organization. If you can follow up with them proactively, you're going to get those seven touches in and be much more likely to get that donation. Um, you need a simple donation or contact process. Um, and, and what that means is basically, uh, can somebody come to your website and figure out how to donate? Um, I'm always surprised when I first start working with many clients how difficult it is to figure out how to donate online. You know, where's the donate button? It's buried under, you know, how to support us or help us or something like that. You got to make that a really easy process. Um, and, and again, coming down to what that most wanted response is or that call to action. You'll hear us talk about these two things. Mainly we'll call it a call to action, but everything you do should have a call to action. We're going to talk about that in the video that Aaron's going to show us, but in emails, in letters, in web pages, anything you do should have some sort of call to action, something that you want them to do. Um, and that doesn't have to be donate every time. That could be something as simple as like us on Facebook, um, tell a friend about us, watch this video. But you want them to take some action. You don't want people to be passive while they're looking at your content. Um, otherwise, you're not getting them to really accomplish anything. Um, so that's very key. Um, the other thing you want to think about is who's your voice. Um, and, uh, you know, this is definitely uh, individual by individual decision, but, or uh, organization by organization, you know, should it be an individual within the organization, like the executive director uh, or the fundraising coordinator, something like that? Should it be the organization as a whole, or do you have multiple um, uh, voices? Um, I think Aaron and I both prefer to hear multiple people um, speaking for your organization. It gives people a better insight in the organization, you know, from people that are, you know, in the trenches doing the work have a very different perspective than the, you know, vice president of development or, you know, something of, something of that nature. So, um, you know, we prefer to see multiple organizations or multiple voices, if at all possible. And the first place to look is with your staff. There's going to be some people on your staff. They're going to be, uh, you know, uh, very hidden, quiet uh, future videographers, and they're going to love an opportunity to grab some video cameras and start uh, collecting footage for you all. So ask your staff, and I think you'll be surprised how many people will raise their hand and say that they'd really like to be involved in this. It's kind of a fun thing and everyone's doing it, so you might as well use that, uh, uh, you know, at least interest that you have uh, within the organization. Uh, next is strategy and planning and, and how you use the video and what are you trying to accomplish with this specific video? And, um, you know, are you trying to raise money directly for a cause? Are you trying to um, gain volunteers? And whatever you're trying to do, you have to keep that in mind throughout the process of strategy and planning and especially production. Um, how, what is the end result of the video? Where is it going to be shown? Who's going to see it? I mean, if it's specifically for web, then it's going to help in some of the equipment that you might use or um, some other decisions that you make down the line. If it's going to be shown at, a, at an event uh, where you already have a ca captive audience, you know, you, you're able to make the video a little bit longer. You could. You could do it you know, somewhere between five and seven minutes if you have a, a captive audience, but if it's going to be shown directly on the web, um, you might want to keep it between two and five minutes um, because of attention spans and, and people getting distracted. Uh, what tools will you need to move forward? Um, tools can also be your assets or people that will, uh, will be involved in, in the piece. Um, if, if you're planning to interview a few key uh, people within the organization, um, what footage will you need to help represent what, you, what they're saying? And um, what else will you need to, to move into the production, production phase? And then your call to action is, is, is very important. Um, it usually comes at the end of, of your video. Um, it can be spread throughout the video, but keeping in mind what you want them to do and, and, and what action you want them to, uh, to do because of watching the video is something to, to keep in mind throughout the planning and strategy parts of this. Um, production is, is from when you start picking up a camera and, um, and start recording. Um, it's, that's the production phase. Um, what's, what's your timeline for, for your shoot? What questions do you need answered before you, before you start production? And what questions are you going to ask your, the people you interview? It all helps to shape and, and, and kind of get a, encapsulate the, uh, the video from all angles. And instead of scripting necessarily, you can, you can kind of 
pick your assets and, and the people involved and the questions you ask them will help shape the video and, and script it in a sense. And um, what list of shots do you need based off of uh, the interviews that you acquire? And you're always going to want to shoot more than what you need because in editing you can refine it and uh, you know, try and get it uh, more brief, the, the better. I mean, it's all going to help the end result and the final product of the video once you, if you have more more footage than, uh, than you think you need. And uh, again, your call to action is something that you need to keep in mind and make sure you, you capture during production and uh, making sure that, that that's, um, you know, that's definitely in the video that you're creating. And it de last is, is have fun. It, it definitely shows if, uh, if it's a stiff, rigid video. I mean, even if it's about a serious topic, you can still have a fun, upbeat, high-paced, you know, energy, high-energy approach to it. And um, if you're having fun, then most likely the, uh, the audience will, will see that and they'll have fun watching it as well. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah, no one, no one wants to watch a boring, monotone video of you talking about your organization. It's really not going to uh, uh, get people to watch to the end of the video. In fact, one of the uh, 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 analytics that Aaron and I look at when we use online video for a client is um, Google Analytics has a uh, key indicator called time on page. And what we do is we'll look at the analytics for a page that has a video on it. And if it's a three-minute video and the time on page is one minute, um, we know there's something wrong with that video, that people are not watching it to its completion. Um, and so we need to go in and, and fix something there. If the time on page is you know, three minutes or longer, then we know that people are watching the entire video. Um, so it's, it's, if you're not using Google Analytics, you definitely should be. Um, and we're going to talk about that a little later on as one of the tools uh, that we highly recommend. Uh, but just wanted to throw that out there while we were looking at the production. Uh, the, the next slide is editing. Um, and there's a reason we had me talk about editing and not Aaron. And that's because Aaron is a professional videographer. He plays in editing software all day long. He thinks it's the easiest thing since sliced bread. Um, you know, I'm not an editor. Um, I've never been a video editor. I've just kind of learned as I've gone along. And so we have me talking about editing because it's a more real world uh, example. This is probably the area that freaks people out the most. Uh, most people are fine picking up a camera and doing some filming and shooting it and then using the USB port on their computer to download it, but then they don't know what to do from there. And so uh, two things that I'd say about it. One, there's two versions of videos you can do. One is a no edit version, um, and some people will call this the uh, gorilla video, and it's basically somebody holding a handheld camera and walking around the office and interviewing people about you know, your event that's coming up or your project that's coming up and just uploading those straight to YouTube. No editing at all. It's kind of like, it's kind of on the scene type footage. Um, and a lot of people like those types of videos. It's, it's kind of real. Uh, it's, it's, it is just real. It, it feels like it's authentic and real. It's not polished. People aren't rehearsing their answers and there's not cool animations and all this stuff going on. So that's one type of video that you could start doing just, just right away. Um, you know, doing interviews and testimonials and things like that and just upload them. Uh, when I talk about fancy, I talk about actually getting into the editing software now. And that's adding in graphics and transitions and music and all that stuff. Um, there is great software available now that makes this available for all of us. Uh, you know, even me who's never edited before, uh, up until just about a year ago, I started playing around with some editing software. So a um, couple that, that we recommend that we know people ha will have available to them. If you have a Mac, um, you have iMovie is included um, with all uh, Mac computers. Um, and that's very easy software to use. There's some great video tutorials. Um, within uh, iMovie that you can watch there. If you have a PC, you can use Windows Movie Maker 2011. Um, and if it's not currently installed on your computer, um, you can go download it for free from uh, Windows or from the Microsoft website. Just search for Windows Movie Maker 2011 and you'll get the download. And you basically just download it, install it, and it's a great program for doing um, editing. Um, you can do transitions and music and slide effects and all, all, all kinds of amazing stuff. Um, there's also some online video editing uh, software. Um, the, the one I was recommending was jcut.com, although just before this webinar, I went to the URL to make sure it was still uh, available and free, and it turns out like that they were just purchased by another company, and it looks like they're on hold right now. So jcut may not work when you first go to see it now, um, and I'll try and see if I can find some alternatives that are online uh, by the time we post the slides. Um, up on our up on our site, but the online one's nice because you don't have to download any software. You can just upload your video, and then you can do all the transitions um, and 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 all of that stuff. 
Um, and what I say on the editing is get one of these programs and just start using it. Test, experiment, have fun with it. Um, if you don't want to do it yourself, see if there's someone on your staff that, you know, again, wants to be a videographer, um, and they would love to go learn uh, a new software program on, on, on how to edit video. And, you know, they'll probably make some really bad video with some horrible transitions, and the more they practice, uh, the uh, better it'll get. Um, and, and the last thing is when to know... Uh, when to know how, when you should outsource to a professional. And I'm, I'm going to let Aaron talk about uh, about that a little bit since he is the, the professional. Editing uh, seems to take a little more, there's a little steeper learning curve than, uh, say, shooting. Um, I have a few clients that I've, you know, I've trained some, some of their members of their staff to be able to shoot and shoot efficiently uh, footage at the events or, or even just interviews or anything that they want captured. And um, through, through lessons learned, they can... Um, you know, since these, uh, these staff are going to be at their, these events and gonna, are um, always present at the, the organization's um, functions, they can easily have a camera there. But then um, it's a little steeper learning curve for the editing, and so sometimes they'll pass the footage to me that they've shot to kind of edit and, and put together in a coherent manner that they, they can then put on their site or, whatever, or YouTube or anything, Twitter, Facebook, to kind of get the the word out there and it's 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 not impossible to obviously to learn this more professional software there's just a little steeper learning curve. Excellent. And the last thing on how to do video is the hosting. Um, another thing that confuses folks or you know is kind of a, a hurdle to get over. Um, we recommend just starting with YouTube. Um, it's free to get a YouTube channel. It's easy to use. They've made it so it's easy for pretty much anybody um, to use. You can upload your video, grab your embed code, which is that little code there. You paste that on your website or blog, and your video is playing um, on on your website. And YouTube handles all of the uh, all of the uh, you know the, the hosting of it and, and the cost of, of hosting that. So it's it's free for you. You can also get a YouTube channel, which means a place you can hold all of your videos, and you can brand that channel with your logo and your colors and and all of that stuff. If you're a nonprofit, YouTube has a great program. If you go to YouTube.com forward slash nonprofit um, or nonprofits, um, I, I believe. Um, you can apply for the YouTube nonprofit program, and what they do is they give you a free business level account, uh, which la allows you to do some extra things um, that most people have to pay for. Um, you can add links into your videos, you can add annotations into your videos, so you can do a lot of cool advanced stuff, so we highly recommend going and applying for that program. Um, right away. Um, the other thing YouTube gets you is extra promotion. Um, you know, they're, they're going to be putting your uh, video out there and people can find it on YouTube. Um, and since Google owns YouTube, um, Google also ranks YouTube videos very high in the search engines. Um, in fact, there was a study done by Forrester Research um, and they found that a video uploaded to YouTube had a 50 times better chance of getting ranked on the first page of Google than a content page, than a written content page. So video, 50 times more likely to get on the first page of Google. So if that's not a reason to be doing video, I don't, I don't know what is. It's going to be a much easier way for people to find you uh, and, and your organization. So now we get into the very weird part of this webinar. Um, what we're going to tell you to do is go to this URL and go watch the video. Um, it's about a three minute, 48 second video. Um, we have the URLs in the chat box. Hopefully. You all can see it there. I'll also put it in the question box. Um, I think I put it in the question box already. But go watch the video. We're going to wait about four minutes now to give you a chance to watch that, and I'll stop talking. Um, Aaron and I might still talk to each other, but you don't need to listen to us. Just listen to the video. Go ahead and go. If you have any problems, type it in the chat box or the question box, and we will try and help you.
Okay. Looks like we have a lot of people typing in done, done, done into the question box there. So that is good. We'll give it a couple more seconds just in case somebody had a slow internet connection. Okay, looks like we have most people done. So we'll go on. If you didn't have a chance to finish it, um, you can go ahead and watch it again um, at the end of the presentation. And we have the URL um, right here in the, uh, in the document, so you can go back and watch that again and again um, if you want to go over the slides once more. But I'll have Aaron go ahead and start into the video breakdown. So this is a film we created for a company called Right at Home. Uh, they obviously offer home in-home health care and assistance for anybody, not just the elderly, but uh, anybody who, who needs, needs assistance and a, and a caretaker. Um, this specific owner, Kristen, she has locations in Houston, Galveston, and Austin. And uh, she has this um, video posted on the front page of her site, you can see here. And um, so anybody who comes to her site has an opportunity to watch this video and, and we've done a few case studies and, and it's you know, people are more likely to watch a video than they are necessarily to to read um, a whole page of, of just text and information. Um, we gave you know we gave this business a, a human and a relatable face so, so people can can get a feel for, for what they they actually do. Um, these days people Google you and, and want to meet you before they actually meet you in person. Now they'll either look you up on Facebook or LinkedIn and kind of want to see your background and, and where you're coming from um, before they before you actually have a meeting with them. And um, she put this on on the front page of her website so all her locations can see who she is. Um, this has helped her her potential clients get a feel for the organization before they schedule an initial meeting with her. And she's the one who who always goes out to meet these new clients. And so now they feel like they can kind of already know her before she comes out and, and talks to them about their needs um, for, for caretakers. Um, having videos, and, and especially for this organization, um, it adds a level of transparency, which, which helps with a business like healthcare, and especially nonprofits with, with programs and services to get a feel for, for what they do and um, have a, you know, a transparent approach to, to the full organization. Uh, we use documentary methods to create these nonfiction short films to, to have a real honest approach and, and to help audiences relate to these organizations and the people who run them. Uh, I realized a long time ago that documentary and, and nonprofits have a lot in common. Uh, both are trying to raise awareness, create social change, uh, raise consciousness, and, and get people to, to act and, and to, to be ed more educated and, and to, to support those who are disadvantaged. Um, the, the elements within this section, um, this video breakdown section of the presentation, are, are not necessarily in any formulaic order. Um, these are some necessary ingredients that, that help with conveying your story or any story and, and helping people relate to, to who you are and, and what you do. Um, there's definitely a recipe and, and ingredients that need to be involved in structural elements that need to be in every video, but not every video has to have every one of these items that, that we go through. Uh, rules are made to be broken, and, and the documentary genre has definitely evolved over the, the past few years. And with the onset of reality TV, people definitely have their guards up a little more and are, are, are more reasonably doubting uh, what is actually real. So using these elements along with your own personal touch and approach um, will help to be able to tell your story. There definitely needs to be a beginning, middle, and end, which is essential in building any story arc and establishing that. We're going to go through these sections, um, section by section, of this specific video and let us know if you have any questions along the way. Um, this woman, Kristen, she, ho she opens with the miss mission of Right at Home and focusing on what the client wants and needs and, and being able to deliver that. And she states the goal of her organization as well as her personal and business beliefs and, and working with her clients. This is very clearly stated, and, and she says with enthusiasm, it's a lot easier to believe people when they're, they're passionate in their delivery and passionate about what they're doing. Um, next, the, uh, the problem and dilemma, the, the conflict within the story is established. And um, the daughter says she realized that her mother needed a little extra help around the house. There was bathing, cleaning, um, taking her medications, etc. 
she couldn't be there all the time to help her mother. As, as, as the audience, we keep this in mind as the story progresses and, and what, what was set up to, to show the problem. You know, we see footage of the caretaker with her mother assisting her with the you know, everyday tasks. We can see the direction the video is going and, and the problem is being set up and we're being led towards a solution um, that we'll eventually get to. Through the interviews with, with your characters, you need to try and create some kind of uh, an emotional connection, something that you could potentially relate to or, or be in a similar situation now or someday be in a similar situation. And if I can jump in there real quick, Aaron, I just wanted to point out one of the reasons why I like this video so much and the reason Aaron and I decided to use this one for this training is it does a great job of telling individual stories, um, both on the, on the mission, um, it's the owner and it's talking to her as an individual. And then when we get into the stories, it's about the mother, it's about uh, the, the Mrs. Timms, the, the, the client. It talks to an individual staff member. Again, it's always talking from an individual point of view so you can connect with that person. Um, not once did they go into a whole series of, you know, 42,000 elderly people live alone in, you know, Texas. and all these stats that are just kind of boring and dry. It's always an individual story and how this organization is going to affect them personally. And that's what makes it such a compelling story. And you'll see that being uh, that, that same thread throughout this video. So just as Aaron's going through, just keep that in mind, that it was always on an individual and, and how this was going to, to affect them personally. Yeah, again, along with that and in, in your strategy and, and planning, um, you should be able to pick people to help tell your story that you can empathize with and uh, can kind of relate to. I mean, this is, you know, looks like any grandmother, looks like kind of like my, my grandmother. Um, and ask, plan, and ask um, good, personal, honest questions that, that help with the exposition and, and getting through the story. And uh, we'll go into exposition next. Um, in a documentary, the exposition tends to occur towards the beginning and introduces the uh, important themes of the film. It's, it's important because it creates the viewer's first impression and uh, the audience and it introduces the audience to the content and characters. These segments of, of the documentary or the short film um, are chosen in order to catch the viewer's attention and uh, keep them keep them engaged. Um, toward, you know, this is tends to happen towards the beginning and a, and a good beginning creates an audio and or visual hook to catch the audience's interest. Um, a hook is something that demands their attention. It sets up the flavor of things to come, um, both in the story and audio visual sense. Um, it creates curiosity among the audience and um, you kind of want to learn more about their individual stories and kind of where their story is going and, and how um, they, they found the solution, if they did. Um, reveals the subject and issue to the audience in such a way that they become keen to see events that follow. Um, it creates a, an element of consequence where you don't know what's going to happen next or what, what is the worst case scenario, uh, which, is, which is one event leading to another, um, cause and effect which will direct the audience and increase their understanding of the subject matter. Um, B-roll footage is um, it's a more technical element, but it's still very important. Uh, the other things in this section we're talking about are a little more conceptual, but this is definitely essential in assisting in the, the telling of your story. Uh, B-roll footage is, is supplemental or, or footage that helps represent what the people in the interviews are talking about. And um, it, it helps to add meaning and, uh, and sometimes um, disguises um, unwanted elements that from your interviewees. Um, this is it's a way to cover some cuts or, or edits within the interview so the viewer doesn't see where a cut is made and, and uh, you can combine different sentences or different people to to, to help tell the story and, and be able to use the b-roll footage to to supplement that um, it's also a way to cut away to see what a person is talking about if they're talking about a, a caretaker helping them then we, we cut to a caretaker who's assisting a, a client um, can also be used to hide verbal tics that can be distracting. Um, people saying uh or um, you can take those out if you have um, footage to, to put over the top of those. Similarly, a part of a, a sentence or an anecdote can be removed um, to construct a more effective, succinct delivery. 
And, and Aaron, these would be things you'd be adding in the editing process, right? So you'd have like, and so adding in small clips and in between maybe two, two interviews or two questions, you could put a small B-roll clip. It's just basically to fill in and, and, and like you said, cover up some other stuff. But this would all be done during the editing process. And this is why you always shoot more video than you think you're going to need so that you'll have some of that B-roll footage, right? Right. It definitely helps with transitions um, as well as, you know, you're going to want to think about this during the production process as well. After you shoot an interview with somebody, kind of go back and listen to what they were saying during during the interview and try to capture footage that can represent that. If you have to go back and to a different location and, and shoot some more stuff to help represent that, it's it's all worth it and will only help the, the end product and people do to further be able to relate to, to what the people are talking about. Um, the next section is, is provide, you provide a solution. The, um, here's where you lead to the solution of a character's dilemma and, and problem. The, the daughter expresses the need of, to have someone uh, around to be a caretaker for her mother when she can't be there with her. Right here, we don't initially establish who or what exactly will be the solution and the resolution, but we find a key element uh, that will help to solve the conflict we constructed earlier. So she said, my mother, we realized my mother needed uh, a caretaker, and that directly that next goes into the resolution where uh, right at home comes in and saves the day. Uh, by finding the solution, we're led to the resolution uh, to find them. The daughter goes on to describe why and, and how right at home fits perfectly for her and her mother, and it's it's comforting to know that somebody's there to to be with her and at all times. I also want to say really quick there that uh, last time Aaron and I presented, uh, we presented a live workshop here in Austin, and I hadn't seen this video before the workshop, and so he started playing it, and right about at this point where you, uh, it's this point and then in the testimonial where the, where the, where, where the client is talking, um, I actually started to tear up a little bit, and I was like right in the middle of the presentation, and, and again, it was that individual story. I know I keep coming back to it, but it's probably the most powerful thing that you can do is telling that individual story, and it really got me emotionally connected to this organization and, 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 and wanting to learn more. And Rich just mentioned the uh, testimonials, and this is the next section or the next element that um, should be should always be involved. I think it's it's where she says um, living alone is bad, and there's nobody to talk to. But, and that's where right at home saves the day. Right at home is good. Um, the, uh, we're now introduced to the mother and, um, and how it's made her life more enjoyable to have somebody around. So she's satisfied. The uh, the daughter satisfied. And the, uh, the business is satisfied because they have another client as well. Another section is the uh, explanation of pro programs and services, and that's done through an, in an individual perspective. The, um, the One of the staff members goes in to talk about how uh, they match the compatibility of their, their clients to their caretakers and how the, uh, the clients can make their own schedule and how you know maintaining independence is key for some of these people. They're not ready to to move in with their family or to, to be um, totally dependent on, on somebody else. And um, the flexibility of services helps keep all the services accessible and providing exactly what the clients want and, and need at all times. Um, it's always essential to pick people who and 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 edit in a way that that people can create an emotional connection, leaving some time there for people to, to kind of let the information soak in, and you know, hear from the caretaker's per perspective. She's talking about the owner and how she cares about the uh, the clients and and her caretakers um, as as people and not just as numbers or as money coming in. She she's creating emotional connection because she cares about everybody that she works with and then talking uh, about the caretakers and, and, and how they can be there and just for somebody to talk to um, you know and again uh, she says she's much happier now to have somebody around um, next is kind of presenting a, a worst case scenario or where you would be without uh, without the services, you know, without right at home, she most likely have to be in a nursing home, which 
you know, not, neither of them wanted, and um, and it's just a, a great opportunity for her to stay flexible and independent. Next section is kind of the takeaways. Any documentary uh, must have a reason for being made. There must you know, be certain things you want the audience to take away from the screening. Uh, should they learn about a character or subject? Do you want them to ep empathize with another way of life or a tragic you know, situation? Whether it's an emotional or intellectual response, you, you hope to listen. Make sure that you have a clear purpose with your, uh, with your project. And again, emotional connections help people support your cause. And, and actually, Aaron, I wanted to jump back. I think this is a really good kind of one-two punch here. So if we go to the previous slide um, where we have where would you be without, so you kind of set up, you know, what would happen if we didn't have, and so for a nonprofit, it would be what would happen if we weren't here. Um, if, we, if we weren't here to help our clients, this is what could happen, and that leads directly into the call to action. So you're showing the what will happen without, and then here's where you can help us today. You can help us bring these services to XYZ. I think that's a really good one-two punch um, to have with your with your call to action. So you're not just asking money, you know, you're not asking for donations just because you want more donations. Um, you're giving the need that has to be filled and then giving them an opportunity to help fill that need right there. And if you've developed that emotional connection throughout the video, people are going to want to donate to help Mary. They're going to want to donate to help those specific clients and that and that emotional connection that they that they that they saw there, um, and that's so. That's all I wanted to say. Is that the end of your video breakdown, Aaron? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, just again, here's the call to action at the end of the piece. Whether you uh, are giving them URL just to find out more information about the organization or the subject or the, you know, the people involved, or it's a URL to a donate page where you want to help them support the cause. Um, or if it's for volunteers, if you're trying to you know, create an army of, of volunteers, and, and this, this uh, project, this video, will hopefully move them to, to join the army as well. There's, a, there's always an opportunity for a call to action at the end, whatever it may be. Excellent. Excellent. And at that point, I see that we're actually quickly running out of time here. Um, we want to respect people's time, so we'll, we'll go ahead and, and pause here. It's about 12.28. We have a couple minutes. We're definitely open for questions. If you want to type any questions you have into the, into the chat box um, there, um, you can do that, and we'll try and answer them. We have a couple, um, I think, that are already in there, and I will go in and look at those right now. But if you have further questions, please type them into the chat or the question box. And we will uh, look at those. But let me look at what we have right now. And uh, Aaron and I will definitely be doing a second part um, to this webinar. There was a couple things that we couldn't get to um, in this webinar. And that is um, coming up with ideas for other video projects you can do. So this is just one example of kind of doing a promo piece about your organization. Um, but there's a lot of other videos that you can do. So we can talk about those. We can talk about what to do with the videos once you've created them. We can also go more in depth into some of the tools and resources that we use. So that'll be in the, in the next webinar we do. And you guys will all get an email of when we when we have that scheduled but it'll probably be scheduled in the uh, next uh, couple of weeks uh, or maybe next week or so we will we will talk calendars Aaron and I after this and come up with the next one so let me go to the question box here and see what we have we had one question will you email a link to the video when ready for distribution most definitely um, anyone that signed up for this we will email you out uh, a link to the uh, video and to download the slides as well we'll put them into a uh, PDF so you can download those um, we had a couple other questions that came in early on, um, and the first one was, uh, if infomercials are so effective at selling, why do you never buy? <laughs> That's a really good question. Uh, it goes on to say, i.e., do infomercials cater to a certain segment of the population that doesn't include you? Um, there's two reasons why I don't buy from infomercials. One is I'm doing it as a study. Um, I'm trying to just see what they do um, and, and, and how they do it and just, just trying to learn from that. Two, if I bought all the things uh, that I wanted to on infomercials, my wife would divorce me. So uh, my marriage <laughs> depends on me not buying all the things on infomercials. Uh, so it's very dangerous. I want to buy them. I really do. But uh, I, would, I would probably buy too, uh, too, too many. But mostly doing it for learning processes. Another question that came in from Christina was, do you recommend a YouTube channel or embed video or Facebook video? Um, I'll answer really quick and then I'll let Aaron answer. Um, I prefer starting with YouTube. Um, one, you're going to get a YouTube channel. YouTube's going to help distribute your content. Google loves YouTube, so they're going to rank your videos um, higher. Um, and it's very easy to embed the videos um, on your website. 
Also, YouTube is picking up the cost of the hosting. So if you do get a viral video or something that gets a lot of traffic all of a sudden, a lot of views, you're not going to have to pay for that bandwidth or extra hosting costs. YouTube is, is, is uh, going, going to pick that up. Um, second part of that answer is my views on Facebook. Um, I'm not a huge fan of social media. Um, I'm not a huge fan of Facebook. Um, I think it's great for an organization to have a Facebook page, but my goal when I work with clients is to use the Facebook page to drive people back to their websites. Um, of course, Facebook wants you, wants the people to stay on Facebook 24-7 and not leave. They want them to stay there and poke each other and play zombie games and all this stuff, but that doesn't help your organization. Um, so I think it's a great tool to get people to know about you, and if I have a video, I would post a link on my wall saying we have a new video, come and check it out on our site, and I would get people to go back to my website where I can control the message, I have their full attention, um, you know, they're not going to get distracted by the zombie, I don't know what it is because I don't do a lot of the Facebook stuff, but, but that's, that's my view on Facebook. Um, do, do you have anything to add to that about YouTube or Facebook, Aaron? Well, similar, I mean, Facebook, once, you, once they get you on their site, they want to keep you there. And it's kind of similar to YouTube. YouTube will provide links to other videos, even if it's not related to what you're watching. You can get distracted and watch it. So I, we definitely recommend embedding it within your site. So if you do post on your Facebook wall, then it takes that link takes you to your site with the embedded video on there. So they're, they're not necessarily in YouTube. So they can stay on your site and try to find out more information and figure out what you want, to, want them to do. Yep. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, let's see, other questions. Uh, yes, uh, another question just came in. How can we increase traffic to videos posted on websites? Any tips? Well, 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 that sounds like an entire webinar in itself. <laughs> um, driving traffic. I think there's a lot of ways that you can drive traffic. And, and the next webinar, we're definitely going to go into some ways that you can use video. And a lot of those ways to use video do drive traffic back to your website. Um, I mentioned putting a post on your Facebook fan page saying we have a new video, come and check it out. That's going to drive traffic back to your web page. Sending an email out to your, to your email list saying we have a new video on our website, come and watch it. Um, Aaron and I have done a couple case studies with clients that we share um, and having a video mentioned in an email increased the click-through rate like four times. Um, people want to click through to go watch a video. so. Put, put links to videos in your emails and, and get people to do that as the call to action. Remember, you want to have a call to action in all of your content, so make that the call to action. Um, in your emails, to you go watch the video. Then on the video page, you can have a call to action for them to actually donate or do something like that. Um, and there's ways that you can now do video directly on your donation page, um, depending on the software you use. Um, the software I highly recommend right now is Sage Fundraising Online. Um, you can email me if you want to learn more or you can go to sagefundraisingonline.com but basically it's a way that you can put donation forms on your website it doesn't go to a third party website and you can have the video right on the donation page so as somebody's watching the video they can pull out their credit card and donate right there so think about that emotional connection that people um, can have with your organization and and they don't break that emotional connection while they're filling out the donation form so, so super powerful. Um, other ways to get traffic back is if you have a video, you can blog about it, you can tweet about it, um, you can uh, also do the search engine optimization that we talked about. Google will rank a video much much quicker and much higher than a regular content page. So I think there's a lot of things you can do, um, but the, you know that's pretty uh, that's probably a whole webinar um, in itself to go into more detail on that. But Aaron, I can definitely talk about doing one on that as well. Do you have anything you wanted to add, Aaron? Well, just in the next webinar, we'll try to touch more on our case studies and. and ways to drive traffic back, ways video can drive traffic back to your site. Okay. Uh, just had another question come in from Scott Gilbert. Have you ever worked with videos that use interactive elements from services like video clicks, wire wax, or click 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 through? Um, if so, what was your experience? I have not done any of that yet. I have done some of the links within YouTube videos um, and the annotations of things like that and have seen some decent click through, but I haven't really done any real experimentation with that. I'd be very interested in in learning more about that um, and, and kind of experimenting uh, with some of that. And I'd love to talk to you more about that, Scott. If you want to shoot me an email, we can definitely um, chat about that. Have you have you tried any of that, any of those services yet, Aaron? I have not. Okay. Okay. Um, I'll let Aaron answer this next question um, from Christina, which is, what type of permissions release do you need from subjects? You can, if you Google um, release forms, uh, video release forms, you can find some template um, or examples of other ones, and um, but I'll also, Christina, send you um, 
one that I use, and it, it's kind of a blanket uh, template boilerplate form that that we use. Um, it's, it's fairly straightforward, and if people, you know, you, you do try to get everybody who's involved and featured um, just to sign one, um, so you can use it for for anything that you see fit. Okay, looks like other people are asking for the release form too, so maybe you can make that available for download with the slides, Aaron. Definitely, definitely. I'll put that on my slide along with okay. the Excellent. slide deck. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. Any other last-minute questions? Um, I guess while we're waiting for those last ones to come in, um, one slide that we didn't do here was basically, what do we do? Um, Aaron and I will just, you know, you can see this when you download the slides, but we basically, you know, Aaron does video, everything from, you know, full-on documentaries to, you know, shorter 30-second type videos. Um, he mentioned creating a video from your footage. Um, he and I shared a client that we actually did that where the client took a lot of footage with a handheld camera and Aaron professionally edited it um, into a really nice promo piece. Um, can do online video SEO, website development, online fundraising. If any questions on any of that stuff, just shoot Aaron or I an email and we'd love to uh, chat with you more about it. We'll also let you know about our upcoming webinars and uh, trainings and uh, hopefully we'll see you guys signed up in uh, some other ones as well. I'll jump in here, see if we have any last minute questions. If not, we will go ahead and end here. Do you have any last things you want to add, Aaron? No, thank you guys for attending. All right. Thanks a lot, guys. I'm going to stop the recording, and uh, we hope to see you on the next webinar. Thanks a lot.